All right, seventh grade, Miss Boyd here, and it's time for Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, chapters 10, 11, and 12, okay? So, chapter 10, we spot back to the Beavers and the kids, and they know they have to leave, okay? And Mrs. Beaver is so worried about packing things, that oh, we might need this, or oh, we might need this, and everybody's just telling her we have to go now. So, eventually, they get some food packed, and they leave. And they're hurrying as fast as they possibly can. So they decide to keep towards the river, okay? Um, because down there she can't get her sledge. So um, they know that it'll be harder for her to get them down there because she has to stay up above. So they're traveling and it's described as tiring and, and it makes the kids wary. And literally, it's almost as if they're, they're walking zombies. They're, they're so tired from how fast they're walking. I mean, imagine walking through snow. Um, that's tiring work. And even the light little pack of food is making Lucy tired. So eventually, Mr. Beaver cuts and they find this cave that's hidden. And um, they know they won't be found in there. So they go in there and they fall asleep. So the next, well, what feels like the next minute, which is actually hours later, they hear a sound outside which is bells. So immediately they're worried that it's the white witch in her sledge. But if you remember when they were getting ready or when she and Edmund were getting ready to leave her castle, she didn't want the bells on there. So immediately your mind should go, that can't be her. She doesn't have the bells on her sledge. So Mr. Beaver goes out to check and you find out it's Father Christmas, okay? And it says that Father Christmas, like in our mind, we think Santa, and it says he's different than in our world, okay? And it says the children look at him, and he's a more serious figure. He, it says he was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still, and they felt very glad, but also solemn, which means they're serious, like this isn't a goofing off time. So. Um, it says, I've come at last. She's weakening. Aslan is on the move. So they know all the great things that they've wanted so long for Narnia are coming true. And then Father Christmas hands out the gifts. And you'll notice these aren't just gifts because, oh, I want this. Oh, I want that. I want the newest, latest, and greatest. These are things that they truly need. From a sewing machine to fixing the dam to the kids' presents. Uh, where Peter gets a shield and a sword um, that has the lion on this shield. Susan gets her bow and uh, the quiver of, full of arrows and her horn that will always bring her help if she blows it. Um, you've got Lucy who gets her small dagger and then the little bottle. And if somebody's hurt, if they get a few drops, it will heal them. And then the last thing he gives them is some warm tea to eat their breakfast to give them energy to finish their travel to the stone table. So they eat their breakfast, but they know they've got to be moving on because they know the witch is going to be traveling too. So chapter 11, we swap back to Edmund and it, it starts off the chapter. Edmund, meanwhile, had been having a most disappointing time. Everything he kind of dreamt up this moment, going back, meeting the witch, being king, blah, 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 is nothing what he thought it would be. So, of course, he wants Turkish delight, and it says the, the witch has nothing nice to say to him. It's kind of like the formality to win him over, all that nice um, banter back and forth and the gifts, all of that is gone, okay? So, she brings him some water, or she doesn't. <laughs> she sends the dwarf boy to bring him water and some stale bread, and, of course, immediately he's like, I don't want this, and her wrath and vengeful glare um, it makes him immediately take it and eat it. And she says, you'll be glad enough of it before you taste bread again. And it's kind of leading you to believe that's one of the last meals she anticipates him eating. So she has Vagrim, um, and she tells him to get wolves together and head to the beavers, kill anybody that's there, and then head to the stone table. And she throws in the statement, what you know what you need to do there. 
And we all know what that means. So any, anything they find, anyone they find, beavers, eater, whoever, kill them. Okay. So they're off. And then the queen is in her sledge with Edmund and then the dwarf driving. So Edmund had, remember, he doesn't have a coat and it's snowing. It's still in the middle of the night. It's still extremely cold. And you can imagine driving on a sledge with the wind is extremely cold for Edmund. He keeps getting covered in snow that's being thrown up on him. And he says, literally, he was wet to the skin. He's miserable. And he would have even given anything to meet the others at this moment, even P even Peter. So at this point, he's regretting every decision he's made. He's no, He knows now, um, and he's had it in his gut that he shouldn't be here. And he knows it for sure. So it's morning, daylight's coming up, and we have a quintessential scene of how cruel the witch is, and Edmund gets to see it. He's heard the stories, but now he gets to see it firsthand. And we have this little group, and they're eating, and it's got, you know, squirrels, dog fox, it, all, satyrs. They're all enjoying food and having a good time. And immediately, the witch stops when she sees people having a good time and having a feast. And through their um, words, when she's kind of questioning them, she finds out that Father Christmas is back. And of course, she's roaring at them and says, you better say that, uh, how dare, dare you? But no, say you've been lying and you shall even now be forgiven. And they can't. Uh, they tell the truth. And she, although Edmund begs her not to, she turns them all into stone. So immediately here, you see Edmund, or you get a chance or Edmund gets a chance to witness how cruel this witch really is because they weren't doing anything wrong. And Edmund begs her not to, and he, the witch even strikes him across the face and says, uh, let that teach you to ask favor for spies and traitors. And off they go. And then the next sentence is a change in Edmund. And it says, Edmund, for the first time in this story, felt sorry for someone besides himself. And so, although he gets backhanded, he real, he feels sorry for the people that were just, or the creatures that were just turned to stone. And he realizes this witch is cruel to everyone and people that don't deserve it. So, as they're traveling, Edmund starts noticing the snow is melting. It's starting to get warmer. You can start to see green. And because of that, the sledge gets stuck and they force Edmund out to help them get it unstuck. And it works the first time, but it's becoming so, so warm and so wet and the snow's going away that they can't use the sledge anymore. So <clears throat> the um, witch tells the dwarf to tie Edmund's hand. And so he Edmund is bound and he's got the rope and the dwarf is behind him with the whip. And so it says, Edmund found himself being forced to walk as fast as he could with his hands tied behind him, sometimes a flick with the whip. Faster and faster. They're moving as fast as they possibly can. And as they're going, Edmund finds himself just glancing at everything. The green, the blue sky, animals, birds, flowers, um, the sound of rushing water, the beautiful smells of flowers blooming. and at this point, the dwarf says, this is no thaw. This is spring. What are we to do? Your winter has been destroyed, I tell you. This is Aslan's doing. And then the chapter ends with the witch saying, if any of you mention that name again, you will be instantly killed. So she has that feeling. She can see the change coming, but she doesn't want to accept what it means. Okay. So last chapter, chapter 12. Peter's first battle. So we're back to the beavers and the kids. And they're enjoying the beautiful flowers and birds and everything like that. And they know because of the warming that the queen cannot travel fast. So they're taking um, this last bit of the journey easier than before. They're taking their time a little bit, resting a little bit more because they know the witch can't travel as fast. So they're nearing the stone table. And then they eventually get to the sea, okay? Um, and we'll talk about that. The sea represents more than just a body of water. 
Um, but they get to the sea and then they get to the stone table. And the first line you have describing the stone table is, it was a great grim slab. So you've gone to, from beautiful description of spring, green, blue, flowers, all these beautiful things. And then we get to the stone table and it's not the adjective you anticipate because you think Aslan, we're going to meet him there. It's going to be great, beautiful, wonderful, exciting. And then we get the adjective grim. So that foreshadows to you that there are going to be some things that happen there that aren't so lovely and beautiful. So we have the table. It's supported by four upright stones. Um, and it says it looks old, it has old writing on it. And then to the side, there's a pavilion pitched or a big tent. And it says it's a beautiful tent. It has um, silk, yellow silk, crimson, which is red. It has the banner at the top with the red lion on it, the same uh, picture that's on Peter's shield. And it says while they're staring at all of this, all of a sudden they hear music. And then they see Aslan, and he's surrounded by a group of creatures, all kinds of things from centaurs uh, to eagles to giants to leopards. And it says, but for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. It says, for when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes. And then they found they couldn't look at him and went all trembly. So in his presence, they felt overwhelmed by emotion. And he's so beautiful and great. They, they almost feel unworthy to look at him. And so they're all kind of um, arguing he's going to step up first. So eventually Peter does. And um, Aslan welcomes them. And it says his voice was deep and rich and somehow took the fidgets out of them. They now felt glad and quiet, and it didn't seem awkward to them to stand and say nothing. So in that moment when he speaks, it's like they feel comfortable, and they know that it's okay to be silent in his presence. So, sorry, the phone's ringing. Um, so, they're begging Aslan to save Edmund. And for Aslan, he knows it's going to be done, and in that moment... We have Lucy look into his face and she realizes something. And it says that um, now his face suddenly um, looked sad. And it said in the next minute that expression was gone and the lion shook his mane and clapped his paws together. And then in parentheses, it says terrible paws, thought Lucy, if he didn't know how to velvet them. And it's that concept that his paws, I mean, if you've ever been to the zoo and you see a, a great lion's paws, they're huge and they're powerful. And it's that idea that Aslan has all this power and they could be terrible. It could be awful if he used his power in a certain way. But it says he knows how to velvet them. He knows how to use his power correctly and in the right way not to hurt others. Okay. So they're getting food ready in the pavilion. The girls are. And Aslan takes Peter up and shows him Herr Paravel, which is where he's going to rule as high king. And while they're up there, we hear the horn, Susan's horn, which means help. And so they look over and then we have the wolf. And the wolf is trying to get to Susan, trying to kill Susan. And Peter, it says, did not feel very brave, but he knew what he had to do. So he went over there with his sword. He strikes and misses, but eventually he kills the wolf. And it says he does. He still doesn't feel brave. He's trembling all over. And in that moment, Aslan can tell that there's another wolf. And he tells the centaurs, the eagles, quick, there's another wolf in the thickets after him. Um, because, you know, the wolf is going to be heading back to the queen, to the witch. And giving her the news. So they know if you follow the wolf, you'll find the witch. And then we can save Narnia and rescue the fourth son of Adam. Okay. And at the end here, it's uh, Aslan and Peter talk. And Aslan says, you've forgotten to clean your sword. Remember, he's killed the wolf. And that's an old school concept of any in battle, if you have blood on your sword, you're supposed to cleanse it with the earth that 
we as human beings were created from earth. God created us, okay? And then you're supposed to return like we all will one day, dust to dust, okay? We'll all re be returned to the earth and buried. And that's the same kind of concept. You cleanse your sword of the blood um, as far as if you um, you return it kind of to the earth like we're all supposed to. And those are your three chapters.